<laughs> hey, yo, what's up? This is Ice-T, represent for Hype Magazine. Stop playing. Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome to another live session with the Hype Magazine. I'm your editor-in-chief, Jerry Doby, and tonight... I have the honor of talking to a man who has met himself again, changed and come anew and is doing some amazing things. Now, you might know him from a reality show called, you know, Married at First Sight. And that was a couple of years ago, season 12, and he became the villain. And many of us vicariously became villains just because of his presence and his actions on reality TV. So I just want to say thank you for those <laughs> those uh, scathing looks, biting comments, and general aggressiveness every time I breathed during that time. Mr. Chris Williams, pleased to meet you, my brother. Man, it's a pleasure to meet you as well. Awesome. Once again, thank you for your service. This man is a veteran uh of the army and uh serve his country honorably and uh kept it moving and he's he's doing some really great things too so now you are the youngest uh person in georgia my understanding is the youngest black general manager of a luxury car dealership in the state of georgia and you're having a grand opening july 1st where you're going to give away a couple of cars. Now you've been giving away cars uh, already. I've seen a couple of news programs where you've surprised some people. It's an amazing thing. Uh, once again, thank you for your service and uh, welcome this evening. Yes, sir. I, it's a pleasure. I want to thank you for having me. Um, anybody that has served in the military 30 years, it's a pleasure to have a conversation because you got some wisdom that you can share with me that I can take from you. So I appreciate that. Hey, I'm happy that you're able to see me rather than view me. That's that's the big accomplishment. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate you. So Chris Williams, entrepreneur, you've been a, a, a money man pretty much since you were in like high school. You were like brilliant at math or something or uh, finance. Talk to me about the early days of Chris Williams. So um, math has always been, it's two subjects. So I'm big on math and I love history. Those are two things. Um, I actually don't think I've ever told anybody publicly that I love history, but I think the only way to understand the future and the present is to understand what happened hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 300, maybe even a thousand um, plus years ago. So I'm big on um, history or whatever. And then also with history, you can see how um, the individuals of that time handled those um, situations. Like for example, you had the pandemic that happened about a hundred years ago as well. And um, you can kind of see, take, you know, certain stuff from what they did, look at the mistakes that they made and try to, you know, um, add to, you know, on um, the success that helped them come overcome that pandemic. Um, in addition to that, math is a big subject for me. I love, 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 love math. Um, I'm not, um, when it comes to like trigonometry and stuff, I'm not, you know, a math whiz on that level, but um, I, I could crunch numbers like crazy in my mind. Um, yeah. I do that. I did that for a living. So uh, yeah. I was raised, born and raised. Um, South Chester Chicago, and uh, it was just poverty, poverty, violence, gang violence, everything. And uh, I wanted a better life, so um, I owned a car outright. I was selling cars. Uh, I got bored. I was a top salesperson. I wanted to do finance. I paid for myself um, to go to a finance school. It was a small trade school in Phoenix, Arizona. Got there, did the school. Um, Used up most of my money flying to different cities. Interview. Got to South Florida. They hired me, but I didn't have a lot of money. Had enough only to rent a car. And uh, I had to make a you know decision. I can get an apartment close to where I work. Or I can rent a car and be able to move around and maneuver, you know, through, you know, the South Florida area. I decided to rent a car. And um rented a car. I had uh, uh 
I would uh, wash up Planet Fitness, put my clothes in the cleaners. Literally, like if they had to move my car in the park, parking lot at the dealership I lived in, you would literally see clothes, dirty clothes, hamper, and um, covers all in the back seats. It was embarrassing, but it just was what it was. I knew I had something that I was working towards. And um, I knew that I was going to get to my goal by any means necessary. And I wanted to do it without the help of my family. I could have called mom. I could have called dad and said, hey, um, grandma, hey, you know, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? I'm struggling. I wanted to figure it out. And I made a determination that I wasn't leaving South Florida until I had it figured out. Okay. That's an amazing story of intestinal fortitude. You know, it, it takes a lot to choose being houseless, but mobile, and to deal with, you know, the stigma of, of that. But it seems that it worked out fine. It, it you know, strengthened your mettle. It, it, and here you are, you know, I mean, at the top of the game, you've earned your way. And I think that's probably one of the most satisfying things for you, maybe is that you could say, I earned this step by step. Yes, sir. Okay. I didn't know if I, you could hear me or if I was freezing up. Okay. So. Yeah, your phone's kind of freezing up. Yeah, I'm not on the phone. I, I'm on a hardwired computer. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I got all my bars. Yeah, yes, sir. I have all my bars on my uh, Wi-Fi. Yeah, I, I'm not on Wi-Fi. I'm, I'm hardwired into the router, so hopefully uh, it gets better. Okay, so July first, youngest black man as a GM of a dealership, and uh, you're giving away two cars. Uh, what? was a defining moment that made you decide to give away cars? Cars has been a part of my journey for the last 10 years. Um, um, I, I literally started in the automotive industry washing cars. I used to drive rich clients, middle-class clients to their homes. Um, I was... Um, an assistant, I was a porter, I would move cars, I would wash cars. Um, I did all of that, you know, um, while I was going to, you know, um, a small Bible school on the south side of Chicago. Um, so I started off with that. I know what it's like to be a single parent, not personally, but I've seen it firsthand um, to, for single parents within our neighborhoods, within our communities, within our churches who have kids and struggle getting around, struggle keeping jobs because transportation is a problem. Um, I see it even on a daily basis where people, you know, um, they can't afford cars. They want to, they need, they want to buy a car and they can't afford to get a car. And if it was up to me, I would help every, every single mother in um, the world. But for me, um, I think it starts off with one. And maybe I can influence, you know what I'm saying, other individuals, other dealerships, other, you know, um, influential individuals to be able to, you know what I'm saying, carry the rest of the load and, and help out, you know what I'm saying, other homeless mothers, other, you know what I'm saying, single mothers, other single fathers, not just limited to mothers, because you got single fathers out there as well right. that are struggling, yeah. struggling. So um, for me, that was uh, that was a big thing. Okay. And you know what? People don't really look at, you know, what we call the trickle down ec economic situation. If you don't have transportation to get to a gig, if you had a gig, you're going to lose it eventually in a couple of days because you're not able to show up. So you can't pay the rent. You can't feed your family. So it really is kind of tied, you know, and you may not even have the money to get on public transportation. So it mobility is, is a big thing. This is a, this is a big thing. So, I want to skip across. I know that you suffer with depression as a homeless person, as someone or houseless person, excuse me, to be correct. And after having a bunch of negative national exposure, talk to me about this, the similarities in the feeling of depression 
that you had as a houseless person with a mission that wasn't quite there yet versus being a national pariah in certain circles? I think for me, and you probably can relate to this slightly, um, I think that if I have the military background, I would not be where I'm at today. Yes. And um, like you said uh, previously, um, the military is going to tear you down. Whatever you think you know, whatever you thought you know, it's over. And um, they rebuild you up. So I am, I have the capability of handling stresses that other people, if they were in my shoes, would fold, jump off a bridge, jump off a patio, you know what I'm saying, kill themselves for it. Like the level of stress and pressure that I have to deal with you know what I'm saying, or have dealt with, you know what I'm saying, just in my 20s. I'm not even going to go into any further than that. Just in my 20s, people would fold. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it interesting, you know what I'm saying, when people, you know, have opinions on what you they think you should do in certain situations. Um, for me, depression has played a, a major role. It actually runs through my family. Um, depression, um, I've battled it. I, I am in constant battle with depression. Um, I battled it before the show. I battled it after the show. Um, and uh, that's what it is. Um, but for me, um, the correlation between what I said as far as being in the military and this is it gives me that mentality that, that if I'm going to wake up and have to deal with depression, then I'm going to give it the best fight that I can give. Oh. I'm going to give it the best fight that I can give. That's right. Some days I'm going to lose. I'm going to lose. It's going. It, I, I have. I've had days where I don't even want to get off the bed. Like I, I'm in the dark. The, 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 I'm just being honest. You know what I'm saying? I'm in the dark. Windows closed. I don't want to see no light. Leave me alone. You know. Um. And that's fine. But then other days, it's just like, you know, I'm not, we're not having that. And uh, I think that going, you know what I'm saying, being focused on purpose helps you get through that. It helps you understand, like, hey, this, this is temporary. This is a temporary feeling, you know. Um, got to get to the other side and understand what the vision actually is. And I think that, that that's what helps me, you know what I'm saying, to fight through on depression as well as you know saying military experience. I I agree with you. Being mission focused uh is a is a, a huge help. And especially for, for people who come from a structured uh background like that. You know, what's the mission? What are we doing? Okay, I gotta train up, get ready and go. This is a new mission, it's life day to day. You know, you want uh, overall health, financial health, uh, which contributes to overall health. You know what I mean? And that's the mission is to not be a harm to yourself or, you know, we're self-starters. We're A-type people. You know what I mean? We're A-type people. So uh, it's cool that you can connect, but we all have those days. You're talking about debilitating depression when you can't get out of the bed. You don't want to eat. Silence. I need to have silence. No TV, no radio, no light. I understand there are a lot of brothers that come back uh, from their time in the service describing what you're describing. And I think that we need to pay more attention to our veterans in that aspect. Be, be you know, a lot faster responsive uh, to their, their needs. But on the positive tip, you come out of it, you've achieved financial success, you're able to put people in a position now where they can help feed their, their families, get around, take care of themselves, be mobile, and access opportunity. What's the most satisfying thus far for you about being in that position besides the personal accolades and the intrinsic, you know, satisfaction you get from the achievement itself? Outside of that, what's the most satisfying for you? I think the most satisfying is uh, just operating your purpose, doing some of your 
passionate about. I people, a lot of people say, hey, follow your passion, follow your passion. Um, and you will find, you know what I'm saying, what you're good at. But in reality, some people are pa passionate about singing and they can't sing at all. You know, some people are passionate about food and they can't cook to save their lives. Yeah. So yeah. that passion is synonymous with um success. I don't think that passion is always synonymous with uh um with uh, achievement greatness. I think that there are sometimes there's a journey that you have to embark upon and during that journey is where you find, you know what I'm saying, hey, these are talents that I didn't even know I had. I didn't know that I was good at negotiating. I didn't know that, you know what I'm saying, um, I was good at, you know what I'm saying, um, I was a charming, you know what I'm saying, charismatic person, you know, and customers, you know what I'm saying, love to deal with me. I didn't realize it just happened naturally. And it was just like, all right, go out, talk to the customer. And then now I start perfecting, you know, you know what I'm saying, skills, start learning, you know what I'm saying, more about it, where for me, it wasn't a thing where, um, because most, a lot of car guys, they get bad reps, they, they get bad reputations, they, they give us bad reputations just because they do things that are conniving, that are sneaky, that are manipulative, and they take advantage of people. I want to take the opposite approach, and um, I wanted to, you know what I'm saying, treat everybody as if it was somebody that was a family member of mine and that's where i found the success at because everybody felt like hey chris is genuine and um just going back to what i was saying earlier um it was a journey my journey started off when um i realized so i i got out of the military a little early um i had a uh had a med discharge and um i didn't know what i was gonna do or how i was gonna do it so people that were graduated that graduated in the class that I graduated because I joined the military on 17, they were already in college and stuff. So what I did was I said, I'm going to take a job. Don't matter how many jobs I have to take, I'm gonna take a job and I'm gonna see if I like it. If I don't like it, I'll quit and just go find another job. I was a good interviewer, I knew how to interview. Um, and I'm not talking about the basics. Like I interview people all the time and you ask them what their weaknesses is. And they say, oh, I just care too much. No, I was a good, I was good. And I was up front. Hey, what is your weakness? I might be five minutes late every day, you know, but my production is going to be great. And they appreciated the honesty. Um, so I had that. I was a great interviewer, but I also was very intelligent and I was a hard worker and I had a great work ethic. I just didn't know what I was good at. So I went through jobs. I was worked at McDonald's. That was, I quit after a month. I didn't like it. I worked as a, a bus boy. I didn't like it. I said, it's not for me. I worked in a call center. I worked selling car, I mean, selling phones. Uh, once I got to Verizon, I was the top, you know what I'm saying, uh, salesperson. Um, I was like, man, I'm actually good at sales. Then I'll start washing cars. And I was like, I think I want to try selling cars. I went, sold cars and salesmen every month, every month on the dot, every month, just consistently. And I was like, this is, I think this is what I'm good at. It felt like I was running my own business, even though I was working for a dealership. So I was like, this is what I'll do. So I started that about uh, over 10 years ago and uh, I've stuck with it through. So, you know, for anybody that might be listening, you might be trying to figure out what it is that you're trying to do or what it is that you're good at. Um, you will find it. If you haven't found what you're good at, you will, will find it along the journey. You just got to pay attention to that. Mm -hmm. every detail. Was there a benchmark moment? Like, was there a defining moment that that you woke up and said, I really am? Do you remember the situation that where you said, I really am great at this? And I'm, you know, like, do you recall that moment? Like, was it a sale? Was it an interaction with a customer, a compliment from a coworker? No, it was just seeing my name. I won all of the contests. Okay. Like, like my first. The people that I, I sold cars with and worked in the dealership with that was in our dealer group will tell you Chris was aggressive. Certain people wake up and they wake up just to hit a little bit over what they need to pay their bills. Me, I'm aggressive. 
<laughs> okay. I'm waking up because I want to take everything that I can get. Even if it's on your plate from a competitive standpoint, I love you. I respect you. But we're talking about sales. I want to beat you in every month, month in and month out. And that was my mentality. So I'm going to beat you. And I garnered the respect of, you know what I'm saying, my coworkers. I garnered the respect of, of you know what I'm saying, my managers and stuff. And like I said, I just perfected my craft. I just kept practicing. I kept studying. Um, how do customers like to be spoken to? How do customers, you know what I'm saying, like to be dealt with? So if I had a person with the alpha mentality, my personality would match a personality because I have a strong personality. But then if I have somebody who doesn't have an alpha personality, have a much soft personality, um, I knew how to tone it down and match them on their level. And now I know there can't be pressure applied to this person. You have to allow them to be able to think for themselves and let them lay out all of the facts and then let them, you know, and decide what they want to do and then be okay with that. And they will respect you more because even if they go to three, four other dealerships, they're going to remember you because you were the only person that didn't apply that pressure. So I made sure, you know what I'm saying? I stood out and I was different from everybody else. Okay. And I treated everybody the same. There's people that, they were, I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm listening to you. I'm just saying it. What you say? I treat everybody the same. There was a guy. True story. There was a guy. Um, he went to a Rolls Royce dealership. He had on dirty clothes, and um, he had on dirty clothes, and um, he was coming from work, and uh, he actually owned the business he was coming from. And he went there because he wanted to look at some Rolls Royces, and no salesperson wanted to deal with him. They said, this dude ain't buying nothing. He ain't, you know. And long story short, he came back the next day and dealt with it. was one guy that wanted to deal with him. And he came back the next day with a suit on and a and a bag full of money. He paid cash for a Rolls Royce. Wow. Years ago. That man was my uncle. They tell me that story to this day. Wow. And um, I... Use that same mentality. You never know what a person got. You got people like me. I'll come, you know what I'm saying, out with a t-shirt hat. But, you know, my last car was like $160,000. You'll never know, you know what I'm saying, I got good credit, you know what I'm saying, and, you know what I'm saying, I'm financially responsible to be able to, you know what I'm saying, get something like that. But, you know, some people, you have other individuals, when a customer comes in, they judge them. They prejudge them. Oh, yeah, I know. I've helped so many people get in cars that had no business getting cars. And I helped so many people that didn't look like they could buy cars and had some of the best credit you'll ever see. Mm. You know, there's this thing going around. Is it is it true you don't have to put down a down payment at the dealership? <laughs> hey, you know, I, I want to answer from a subject matter expert. So let me be very, very clear. We've seen fines handed down to different banks. Wells Fargo is one of the banks that come to mind where they were fined for doing, you know what I'm saying, illegal things with minorities. We've also seen, um, when we come from a banking institute, we also seen, um, there's a dealer group, which I won't name, um, in Chicago, where they, um, it was deemed that they were discriminating with their prices. So black people were getting some of the worst deals and minorities were getting some of the worst deals in comparison to the majority, which were, you know what I'm saying, Caucasians. And they had to pay an almost $10 million fine. The banking industry is heavily regulated. If down payments were illegal, do you think that the, the 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 banking systems that oversee all of the banks, the Fed, the Fed system that they is in place, do you think that they would allow all of these banks to still require a down payment for certain stuff? Well, you know, brother, you did mention Wells Fargo. 
everybody knows Wells Fargo was doing bad, bad business, and they they lost uh, a lot of credibility. They it was doing bad business, <laughs> but you picked you picked the wrong one. That scandals all the way around, credit cards and everything. <laughs> so, go ahead. No, but that's what I'm saying. That's that's the point. I'm using them for for I'm using them to 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 to, to create a point here. Okay, okay. They got caught. They got fined. They had to pay billions of dollars. If down payments towards a car or a mortgage was illegal, the banking systems that that over or the federal systems that are in place that oversee these different departments, these different banking structures, they would have been shut that down. They would have been um um, find these institutions, these banking institutions, is what I'm saying. It, because it's not illegal. A bank, one of the, the, the what the bank's obligation to you is, and I have relationships with majority of um majority of the banks that you know what I'm saying operate in the auto industry. Um, I know a lot of them personally. You know what I'm saying. A lot of the you know what I'm saying presidents and stuff like that. Um, a lot of these um they have. This is what I'm trying to say. Go back, Chris. The banking system has an obligation to offer, make available loans to everybody, right? But they also have an obligation not to discriminate against you because of race, because of color, because of age, because of sex, because of gender. That's their obligation. But if you have bad credit, and you, you know what I'm saying, are, you know what I'm saying, um, you, you are, you know what I'm saying, a 400 credit score, you're a 500 credit score, which I can get all y'all done. I got banks that can help y'all. But there are certain banks that has certain standards that as long as they, <laughs> I had to throw that in, as long as, you know what I'm saying, hold that standard with everybody. So if, if I tell, if I'm a bank and I say, hey, you, you know what I'm saying, um, can't get approved for a loan because you're not over a 600 credit score. I have to keep that same standard across the board. So now if Pete comes and I let him buy a car, but my banking program that we've had set in place says 600 is the minimum, then there's some type of possible discrimination that might be taking place. So now um, if the bank system gets audited, they have to give an answer. Why is it this one person that has a 580 and you got a million other people, you know what I'm saying, who has 600s and you don't approve people under 600? What was the difference between this person from that person? So basically what I'm saying is the standard across the board is the same. Um, it just depends on the bank and the programs that they have set. There are banks that will approve you with zero down, but it's based on credit worthiness. That was a lot. I'm sorry. No, but that was a fair answer. And, you know, you hear all this garbage on social media and these self-proclaimed -pro 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 financial experts, et cetera, et cetera, just giving you a tidbit, just enough for you to go out backwards, basically. You know what I mean? But you're the man inside. Most, most, of those people, most of those people that are saying that got bad credit. I thought so, but, you know, I, I'm a journalist. I'm not supposed to judge. Cause, Cause, me, I don't put money. I don't put money down when I buy a car. I'm just going. I use my credit. I don't have to put money down. The people complaining about that is people that had to put money down because they got bad credit. That's why. Hey, I haven't had that issue. I, you know, I'm like you. I'm financially responsible and do my thing. Yeah. Okay. So I wanted to address that. We have a subject matter expert. The man is the general manager of a brand new luxury car dealership that's getting ready to open July 1st. It's the new Dina Motors. I don't know what part of Georgia it's in. I just know it's in Georgia. Conyers, Conyers, Georgia, Dina Motors. Dina Motors. Right off uh, exit 78 on I-20. And the man said, if you got a 400 credit score, he got somebody for you to help you get a okay. huh? I've done it. I did it today. Somebody bad credit. <laughs> bad credit. Got them done. So he's it worked well. 
He's helping you out. He's not only giving away cards, but if you really probably based on who you are and how you treat him when you walk in there, he may go that extra mile and say, well, you know, they're going to charge you 75% interest, but I could get you financed uh, at 400 and you can walk out of here and here's an opportunity for you to make a better way for yourself. You know, it's more than just getting the car. Maybe I'm putting too much on it, but I'm what I understand you to be saying is that, you know, you're driven by past experience. You put yourself in a houseless uh, position and went from the streets to the suites pretty much literally. And, you know, yes, you've got a nice title now and you're setting a standard, you're making history. Uh, within the state of Georgia, within the auto industry. But deep down inside, you're still that giver uh, that you were in the military. We give. You know what I mean? It takes a lot to stay there and, say, and not say I quit. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? We're giving. So you're doing it now voluntarily and maybe out of a sense of, of you know spiritual obligation as a human being, just human, not religious, nothing, y'all, stop it. Uh, but just spiritual human being to human being. And I have the, the tools and resources to help. And it's my obligation to reach out and help. Shout out to you, you know, because I know you have to work within this corporate structure as well. But as a human being, you're not letting the corporate structure overshadow what you need to do to be a good person corporate citizen in that community am i off no i'm with you i'm with you okay cool cool so what can we expect july 1st uh dina motors in conyers georgia with the youngest black man to ever be a general manager of a dealership what can we expect i know it's going to be uh exciting Uh, it's gonna be crazy. We got celebrity appearances. We got radio stations. It's gonna be broadcasting live. I ain't even announced that, mm. but radio stations that are gonna be broadcasting live from um our dealership. Uh, we also got food. We got games. So we got uh, stuff for the kids. We got inflatables outside. We got cars. You got me. You got everybody. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna be fun, man. It's gonna be fun. Okay, so you're making it a real community event. Say we're we're here in your community, and we're here to serve you. And you politicians coming too. Well, of course they go come. You got a GM they, ship. They, they like that. Like babies, huh? I said we all are going to kiss the babies. Shake hands, kiss the babies. Oh yeah. Oh, that's right. Campaign stops. It's, it's a good opportunity to meet the community. Yeah, shake hands, kiss the babies, Mr. Pop, in Georgia. I, 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 You know what? I can't even follow that vein because I was getting ready to, to get into something. Um, I'm going to kiss the baby's foot, man. You're going to kiss the baby's foot? Yeah. No, I'm, I said I'm going to kiss the baby, too. You're going to kiss the baby, too? Okay. Yeah. Kiss, she, she's closing deals, too. She's going to be out there closing deals. What up, baby? I see you. Don't get shy now. You just looking at the camera. Oh, I didn't mean to scare you. What are you most looking forward to in your new role as the general manager of, of Dina Motors? Um, impacting lives, changing lives. Um, to be honest with you, like you really don't know the type of impact that you have on people until like they actually tell you, um, yeah, you really do not know. And um, I, I would never share, you know what I'm saying, or, you know, exploit anybody, you know, that has worked for me or work, you know what I'm saying, for me. But um, we really change lives. We 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 don't just talk about this and do it just when the cameras come on. It's, so we do this literally um a daily basis, man. We do this on a daily basis, pouring mentoring, you know what I'm saying? Um, people, 
whether it be on a job, whether it be customers, whatever, you know. I remember years ago, I used to help people pay their down payment. We didn't have enough. Hey, here, how much you need? You know, and it was more than what my commission as a salesperson was going to be. And, but it was just like, yo, I know if I do this, and this is my major thing, if I bless you, there's nothing you could do, you know what I'm saying, to repay me back that would be on the level of what I feel like God will give me for being blessing you, if that makes sense. Yes. So it's for a bigger cause. It's kind of, it might be a little selfish in nature because you might say, hey, he's blessing this person. He's blessing that person. He's blessing this. But I'm doing it, you know what I'm saying, with the intention of God blessing me back on a greater level. So now if I could do that, you know what I'm saying, there's a scripture they used to tell us in church. If you be faithful over a few things, you make it rule. So I feel like if I could be faithful, you know what I'm saying, show, hey, we, we're faithful, you know what I'm saying, on this level, why can't I have, you know what I'm saying, why can't we have 100 dealerships across the country? Mm. Absolutely. Why can't Tyler Perry own a BET? He's been given for years. Why can't he own a BET? Why can't he own the largest you know what I'm saying, a studio in the country. That's motivation. Yeah, it is. Motivation. Right, she was homeless. That's my motivation. So now I'm like, yo, I'm going to keep giving. I'm going to keep giving. Doesn't matter what people say. I don't care. Because now, you know what I'm saying, it's not about you. It's between me and God and the person that you bless. You know, it's beautiful. I really wanted to get into your personal business. But I want to celebrate your personal business, doing business, being an entrepreneur. How much that subway franchise cost? It was a couple. I love me some sandwiches. <laughs> I'd be broke. Yeah. I'd be broke because I'd eat the product. Yeah, the Italian, the Italian cold cut sandwiches. It's a wrap. <laughs> You crazy. <laughs> oh shit. I am though. Just, they just finding out though. Uh yeah. The subway. So subway pandemic, of course, affected a lot of people. It's hard. You know, yeah, supply chain issues, uh, personal issues, people, you know, lockdown issues. A lot of people were affected, but you came through another situation on top. As the top guy here now at the, the dealership. So uh I I wish I could be there just to be the fly on the wall to watch the satisfaction and the excitement of the community July 1st in Conyers, Georgia, where this young brother here will be the first, the youngest black man to ever have a dealership, a luxury car dealership. GM, baby. I'm a GM fan. Can you tell? Uh and it's come a long way. Therapy, depression, self-reflection, self-motivation. Despite all the BS that life has thrown at him, he keeps making it. That's an example. Aside from the money and the finances and all that good stuff, that's a showcase example for our young men who are weak in the knees talking about, I can't do it, I can't do it. I can't figure it out. Yes, you can. You say we don't have strong examples of black men in our communities. Chris Williams is one of those. The reality TV crap, you know, they edit that crap to make it look maybe sometimes a hundred times worse than it actually is. You know what I mean? But this is somebody who's showing you reality about just being a great human being. I care. And I want to make sure that people get a fair shake and a fair deal. And if I could be the first one to do it, he said earlier, you know, why can't we have 100 dealerships? We don't have to revisit Black Wall Street. We need to create something, you know, modern day. But with gentlemen such as Mr. Chris Williams here, and you know, corporate examples like Dina Motive giving him the opportunity to run the ship. 
I say these are the kind of stories we pick up, push forward, and support. So, is there anything you wanted to cover, Chris, that I may have missed? No, I think you covered everything. I'm I'm grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'll say this uh, before I let you go. Um, there's a difference from being um, a bad person and making bad decisions. There's a difference. Right. Bad person is a person who takes an army and invades an innocent neighboring country like Ukraine. And I don't mean to get in politics. No, know, get so. it. Go on, get it. Go on, get it. Get it. But um, you, you know what I'm saying, um, invade um, illegally um, a neighboring country and um, innocent lives are lost um, as a result of your decisions on a daily basis. On a daily basis, innocent kids, innocent moms, innocent elderly individuals. Um because of that decision you made. Um, uh, a bad person is an individual who um, is a serial rapist or a rapist in general, you know, whether it be younger kids or, you know, um, older individuals, uh, a serial murderer, that's a person, that's a bad person. Bad decisions is um, what happened with me. And I think that People, you know what I'm saying, don't separate the two. You're talking about a young guy um, worked his way up and uh, made some bad decisions on the show. And uh, I want people to understand, and I want to be inspirational, you know what I'm saying, to other individuals that it doesn't matter what decision you have made, you can overcome and rebound from that bad decision. People make bad decisions all the time. People have a lapse in judgment all the time people sleep with the wrong guy and get pregnant have to deal with that bad person for 18 years that's a bad decision you know but no matter what the decision that you made in your life you can overcome it and i myself you know what i'm saying um i i am going to you know what i'm saying i'll take responsibility for whatever part i play in whatever part whatever i've ever done in my life but um, I'll never take responsibility for anything else, you know what I'm saying, beyond that at all, right? And um, I think that, that uh, when I look back at the network and stuff and how things played out with that, I know we're not talking about that, Um, I do feel like uh, I was a scapegoat. But what people don't understand is a million different factors going on behind scenes. Mm -hmm. Um, Like, for example, you could have a two-hour conversation and – um, they only play two minutes of the conversation and they take, you know, different words of it and, you know, do wordplay and then the music and then play on your emotions. And you're like, that's not what I said during that particular moment. That's from a different conversation and it just looks crazy. And um, I had to deal with that because, and that's where the depression kicked in because you had, I had a situation where it was just like, I've worked so hard for this reputation that, you know what I'm saying, I've generated, you know what I'm saying, that I've, um, work for and uh, for it to go away like this but the thing that kept me sane as well was I felt like this was an opportunity and uh, I come from a religious background um, I've not been the most religious person in the last five or six years but um, I felt like it was an opportunity for uh, God to use my story to help bless others and people be like yo how how would God use your story to bless others? And you were a villain on um, Married at First Sight. Well, you know what I'm saying? You look at it, you want to go to the Hebrew Bible or you can go through, you know what I'm saying, to the Christian Bible. Moses was a murderer. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go deeper than that. Yeah. yeah. Let's go deeper than that. David purposely put a man out, you know, you know what I'm saying um, he purposely put in the Bible, King David purposely put a man that was in his army on the front line to get killed so he could sleep with his wife. Yeah. He's an individual. Huh? I see. Yeah. Yeah. It's so many different examples, you know what I'm saying, that you can use and see, you know what I'm saying, where God uses 
people who made who had a lapse in judgment. <laughs> had a lapse in judgment. Yeah. And people might be like, yo, you, you look at Moses, he killed the guy. And you kind of like, yo, he was on Egypt's most wanted list. So he was, there was a reward out for him, right? But then you look at him, he comes the next time you see him, he's talking about, hey, yo, let God's people go. Like, who is this dude? He's a murderer. Who is he thinking this? Mm -hmm. It's the same way. He's a villain from Mavs, fan, from Mavs. Who does he, Chris think he is? No, it's not about who I think I am. It's what is how can I fulfill my God given purpose? And sometimes it takes mistakes to realize I'm here for a bigger cause. That was it. <laughs> I love it. That's why I just sat there silent. Like, we have to listen to black men. There's a reason why we could be a really aggressive sometimes during conversations it's because we're not heard. And you're speaking and telling your truth. I'm going to shut up and give you the floor. I wasn't going to interrupt that because I have felt that, that way. You know, of course, now I was raised with nine sisters and a mother. So I was wrong every day, all day long. As long as I came out of my room, when I came out of my room, I was wrong. You know what I mean? When I walked across the carpet and crunched the carpet, I was wrong. There was just nothing I could do. So I understand the stress and the strife, but it's, you know, I, I listen to you. I hear you. I feel you. I've shared that pain. Uh, I appreciate what you've experienced and sacrificed during your military service as well, getting a medical discharge. When you feel like, you know, you're a type person, you're like, I'm good to go. I'm good to go. You never want to accept defeat or under or your mortality. We we're brought up to feel like we're invincible. But brother, you're leaving a legacy that's going to make you immortal by helping all of these people. People will remember you long after they'll be Mr. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Williams, you know, did a lot for this community. Mr. Williams, you'll be Mr. Williams until the end of time because of your actions now and all that other, the detritus from the rest of that will just fall away. And Mr. Williams will be the statue in people's mind uh, based on your actions and things that we can record and document today. I'm in your corner, my brother. Whoop. And uh, we will most definitely uh, love to have you back Let's talk about some community initiatives that you're doing over there, Dina, that you're leading. Uh, once you get comfortable and settled and um, get your program in place, you know, I'd love to have you come back and we can work on making that happen. Thank you so much, Mr. Chris Williams. Reverend, you, you come by, you see us. I laid a red carpet out for you. Brother, I'm an humble man. I just want to find some oxtails wherever I go. You find me some good oxtails, brother. I can't help you with. <laughs> you don't eat. You don't eat meat. I don't know if I can help you with that. Maybe it's a couple of Jamaican spots we can find. There you go. There you go. What? Okay. What? What? Since we on dietary, he says something. What? What are you, are you? Are you like vegan or something like that? You don't eat meat anymore. I only eat like beef and chicken, but I'm finna cut beef out. You can watch me eat the oxtails. That's fine. You can eat your chicken. I'm gonna have some oxtails yeah, no, with brown gravy and some rice and beans and and you know a red stripe and let's sit down and chop it up. Yes, sir. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Chris Williams, the High Magazine Live Sessions. We're out. As an artist, we should reflect the time. Why you so talented? Cause I'm black. Why you so amazing? Cause I'm black. It's really important that we build characters so that people understand their story matters. Two Chains and I both are just really into good food. And when you know you are royalty, you will only aim in life to be royalty.
We're doing it right now. I don't give a damn what they say about me. Yes, I called your ass out. I know I shouldn't be saying this kind of Shout out to Hype Magazine Network. Shout out to the Hype Magazine Network.